Hello and welcome back to Enterprise Linux Security, episode 33 this time. How are you doing, Zhao? I'm fine, Jay. As, as always, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And today we have another of the They Did What episodes that we usually run. So yeah, yeah. this week was pretty interesting regarding that. It, it's almost like it's it's like they, they're able to do what? Um, and <laughs> also at the same time, it's business as usual, but also yeah. bad business as usual, um, bad technology as usual, but everyone likes it. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. We're going to try to um, yeah. summarize it, of course, but the first thing, and some people probably already know where I'm going with this, we got to talk about that Atlassian thing. I mean, that's just so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like, I'm, I mean, have we even talked about Atlassian much? I feel like I've been talking about it in secret the entire podcast when I start complaining about, <laughs> um, you know, people not updating. I'm usually talking about people with Atlassian software, actually, but uh, we'll get to that. Um, yeah, it's like a coming of age. We're going to deal with Atlassian today. Yeah, you actually jinxed Atlassian with the last episode. You mentioned that they were going to be having some vulnerability and then just the next day or two days after that, they did. So hmm, you're suspicious. What have you been doing? Yeah, so I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork just to kind of like give some people who don't already know Atlassian some idea about them. I'm going to try to keep calm, okay? Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is I am sure there are countless talented people working there that are very brilliant people that um, have a lot of tech skills. They're probably really awesome. So sometimes it's it's just hard. I don't like to talk down on companies or their decisions because I also feel like people that work for that company, they could be doing really awesome work. They might feel bad. That's never my point. I never want to make anyone feel bad or anything like that. Um, but sometimes when things are the way they are, you just have to you know mention your worldview and what it was. Anyway, Atlassian is a software company. I think um, most people probably know that. Famous for a number of tools. Uh, Java, uh, I said Java. I, I, I just have Java in my mind. Uh, that's not their product, obviously. A lot of things run on Java. We'll get to that. They have Jira, um, same number of letters. Um, is it? Yeah. So they have yeah. Jira, which is kind of like your ticketing system. You know, like a lot of IT people probably most have that of some sort where someone logs a ticket. Uh, Confluence is another of their products. We'll be talking about th about that today. And they have like Bamboo, they have uh, a Bitbucket, a number of others. And, and one thing about these apps is that you could have single sign-on between them. So, and that's actually pretty, pretty okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as it's done well by concept, it's not bad. If you log into Jira and your account is Atlassian wide, and I'm talking about the hosted versions, we'll get to that. Um, then you, you're already logged into the into the others, um, and there's some security issues that could happen, um, uh, in a, in a, you know, because of that. But their software is using things like Java and Tomcat, and I really hope in secret that they're like developing an alternate version that they're trying to mirror the compatibility to um, sunset the Java version. I don't think that's going to happen. So as a result of Java and Tomcat being a part of this. I'm not really sure how much of it is they, they're just not managing it well, or it's just Java. I'm sure that's the latter because as you know, I think we're going to get into Java is not really the best thing to base yeah. your software on these days that a lot of security issues seem to come out of this. And it's not like any software company is going to be beyond, you know, security issues. It happens to everyone, but it's just like Atlassian just not only do they have this target on their back, because it's embarrassing, like hackers just keep finding flaws. And I, at some point, I'm almost like, is somebody with a kick me sign on, on the back? And, and, <laughs> and, and all the hackers are like, let's go pick on it last and we can have some fun, you know? And that's what it, I know that sounds bad, but, uh, and again, I'm not trying to say that the developers are not awesome people. Like I'm sure most of them just inherited this. They didn't create it. Um, and I'm sure they're doing the best they can, but that does seem to be the mentality I get. It's just a target. It's a big target for, for them. I mean, Jira will get lots of people annoyed. So 
yeah, let's get back to them for creating cheer. Um, yeah, I know it can be pretty aggravating at times uh, to deal with the, the peculiarities of Jira. Um, but yeah, what you said before about Tomcat and Java, it's my personal pet peeve as well. Anytime I see something that runs on top of Tomcat or just pulls in a boatload of Java dependencies and all of that just to get the web page up with a simple application, it gets me really annoyed because you're pulling lots of code that you can't audit properly because it's impossible to do it um, just to do simple stuff. And every single time I get the impression that it's just holding on barely with duct tape and some wire and it's going to fall apart in the most awful way possible at any moment. If anybody sneezes on the next room to the data center, somebody's going to to be dealing with uh, with the Java application that crashed, and right. yeah, I, I can never escape that feeling. So, how do you feel about finding information in logs for a Java app? Is it easy, hard, <laughs> time consuming, quick? What's your also easy? That? Also easy. Let's start with a very simple example. You boot up you boot up Tomcat, and until you get the, that message that says that the server is up, you have twelve megabytes of um, of text one message per line that you have to scroll. That's thousands of lines that you need to go through if you want to find some message there. 12 megabytes just for starting Tomcat. Um, of course, you can control the verbosity and all of that, but this is what comes by default. And at some point, somebody had to have said in one of the meetings that was deciding that, OK, this is absolutely useless. Nobody is going to be able to extract any meaningful information from this. Why are we spewing so many error messages or just some because they're not even error messages. There's just updates and basically, it feels like you're when you're starting up in development and you put some printfs all around the code just to make sure that the code is reaching a specific part. It feels like they just filled the, the whole Tomcat code with those and never took them out. It's what it feels like when you're looking at the, the log. OK, it reached this part, it reached this part, and this one, and this one, and the code is massive. So in technology, there's this trend where you have a product, everybody's using it, and then an alternative comes out and they'll advertise it's more secure, there's fewer lines of code. You know, think, think OpenVPN and WireGuard. OpenVPN has been around a long time. It's humongous, mm -hmm. right? WireGuard comes out as shorter. Long story made short, why does that happen? Because when some things are developed, instead of just refactoring properly and condensing and things, they just bolt onto what's existing. They keep doing that over and over again. Um, it, so that kind of plays to your point there. But the reason why I asked about the logs, right? I am not advocating this. I'm not saying anybody should do this. In fact, I'm going to say nobody should do this. This is this is actually not a good thing to do. I just I'm I'm reporting information. That's all I'm doing. I'm not giving you a way to get back at your employer. Do not do this. <laughs> Um, but okay, if you have like Jira and Confluence in your business, all it takes is more than a certain number of people that just so happen to be running a, a report at the same time. The server's down. Period. It's it's gone. It, it's gone. I mean, it's that easy. You like you cannot like you have to find out. In that case, as administrator, you have to find out. Okay, we got to tell whoever's running the report to please wait because right now. There's too many other things going on. Okay, let's find out who that who ran that report. Now you have to look at the logs. Okay. It's really hard to find out which one person was the straw that broke the camel's back and the server came down. So that's the kind of software that we're dealing with here. And I'm totally not trying to throw it in a negative light. I have been, I've been very intimately involved with Atlassian in the past, several different jobs I used to work at, helping customers and it all comes full circle because the issue is, like we talked about, you have to keep updated. You have to patch your servers. We're going to say that over and over again. And when I talk about frustration, companies generally don't. They'll say, yeah, maybe next month or whatever. Anytime I've said that throughout the entire podcast, I was probably talking about my from my experience with Atlassian because that's usually how it goes. Tell the customer, if I'm hosting it for them, for example, there's this critical vulnerability. I'm doing the right thing. I'm letting them know this is critical. We have to patch it right now. The response is going to be, yeah, maybe next quarter. Um, that That's probably what the response is going to be. And then the next week, they're taken over. 
I, I told you to update. Um, so that's kind of coming all full circle for me um, when it comes to this, because there's a lot of issues here. And it's not surprising to me that there's another vulnerability. Yeah, and we both have experienced sysadmins admins multiple years yeah. doing that. And we're still singling out applications like this that run on Tomcat or like Atlassian specifically for the amount of logs that they spew out because of, out of all the other applications that we've dealt with, other web servers that we've dealt with and all of that over the years, none is so egregiously bad at that specific item like this one. Um, having logs that just spew out an incredible amount of useless information, this is redundant, but it's not useless. It's not useful for the the sysadmin or the users or whatever, you cannot solve problems that way. It doesn't help you track down the problems and finding the actual issue because then it's, <laughs> and again, we're moving away from the, the specific vulnerability. Yeah. We're, I, we're really I, ranting around this. But I think it's and, important to kind of let people know the history and why we're so, um, yeah. You know, all about whenever it. you're trying to, to debug something that uh, that isn't running properly on top of it, um, you'll get lots of error messages in the log and then none of them will probably be the error. The error will be just a warning that pops up before. So if you, even if you're grabbing just for error there, you'll miss the, the warning message. And because there are so many messages in the log, it will be really tricky to, to nail down the one that says, oh, it's because you don't have permissions right here or there or something else. And it can be just something as simple as that. And the application won't boot up because of it. And it's really, really annoying. And sure, you can be there listening to the podcast and say, oh, it's because you guys don't know how to do it or you should never have this in repose or all of it. Nobody put it that way. This is the default. It comes out of the box configured right. like this. You have to yourself remember to re to reduce the logging level, to reduce the verbosity if you want to get away from all of those nasty messages. And to top it off, you have to reduce the verbosity on all of the... <laughs> on all of the libraries that are reporting to the logs. Because if you just move it in one configuration, the main configuration will not affect all the other that are pulled in as dependencies. Those have their own configuration files that you'll have to dig up. You'll have to find where they are. You'll have to look up the specific syntax to reduce the logging on them specifically. And then with any luck, you will probably get some logs that are actually useful. But it takes a lot of work just to get to that point. It really does. And another thing I don't like about this is that if it says error, it might be a warning. Okay, this is how the level, because you will literally, you can look up an error, it says error in all caps, you Google it, and you have people that are more familiar with this particular component saying, yes, it says error, don't worry about it. Uh, one example of this is when they, like they had a product called HipChat for, you know, inter-company chatting, you know, like, like their version of Slack almost. Um, well, I think Slack is what they push people to because they actually um, deprecated that app um, and it was built into everything and there's errors in the logs about it being missing, but they deprecated it, okay? They got rid of it and it was a while later that the errors went away. So I think we've pretty much set the stage that Atlassian software is very, very, very shaky, um, inconsistent, unstable, and very insecure. Unfortunately, I, I wish I wasn't saying that, but that's that's the case. Um, and here we are with uh, a vulnerability, June second of twenty twenty two, and the CVE number for this one is twenty twenty two dash twenty six one thirty four. There's going to be a link to this in the description down below. And if you have no objections, I'd like to call this episode "Admin Accounts for Everyone." <laughs> Yeah, from the description that the, the company that found it uh, put online, they, they wrote a, bo a blog post about it. Let me get their name right. Um, Volexity came out with the exploit analysis. Um, when you have in the description for an exploit that it's easy to trigger and remotely exploitable, you're in trouble and you have a lot of, uh, of problems to, to solve in your piece of software. Um, and it kind of reminds me of Log4j, which was also trivially exploited and provided with remote access. In this case, <laughs> it's a specially crafted URI that will give you remote code execution. Simple as that. Yep. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the script. Oh, here it is. OGNL is, is basically what, what it's hooking into. So somebody who utilizes this vulnerability can get um, 
they can create an admin account. Okay, so this is not just taking over an admin an admin account, which we hear about that a lot. This is allowing someone to create one. That's huge. They can create an admin account, and that's um, absolutely something that you don't want to have happen. This lets you have a remote shell root. Uh, from then, you can do basically whatever you want. There's no no limit what you can do. You root on the right. system. You have a shell at your hand at your disposal. You just type in the commands that you want to do. If you don't want to create a, a shell, you can just pass it the command that you wanted to execute. Say, for example, send the file to a server that you control, for example. Mm -hmm. um, add accounts to the system, like you were saying. All kinds of nasty things, because basically at that point, you control the system. And it's all over from there. And one thing about um, Atlassian that I do want to make sure everybody is aware of, like you should always take it seriously when there's a, a critical vulnerability. 100% of the time, take it seriously. If it's Atlassian, take it 110% seriously because the reason is if it's exploitable, it's being exploited. Uh, it, it's right away. They, they literally have NDAs in place to, to MSPs, which isn't you know sp specific or exclusive to Atlassian. Other companies do the same thing. But it's the case, you, you know. They they come out with this vulnerability. They're they're letting their partners know about this to get them prepared. We're going to re reveal this. What usually happens is someone leaks it ahead of time because I don't know they just do, and people are actually exploiting it. So you should always one hundred percent, like I said, take it seriously, but especially with Atlassian. Yeah, and just to to add to the information, this basically affects all the versions currently in play of Atlassian, and, <laughs> and this is the nasty part, all the versions out of support as well. So if you're still running an older version, you're still affected and you won't get patches for it. Right. So this is almost like a coming of age thing. It's just like so many things come full circle. Like you you absolutely need to patch. There's a, a lot of security things to unpack here. We will, you know, we obviously have more to say about this. I mean, we're not done. I'm just gonna say, this is we're gonna have we're gonna bring this up, you know, in the future. Atlassian software it's gonna keep coming up, and unfortunately, I I would love to be wrong on that. I would love for them to do whatever they need to do to make it more stable, but history is what history is. Yeah, and people with lots of time on their hands have looked at the vulnerability, and there are new ways to exploit this have come up since it was announced, and now there are multiple codes for for exploiting this, basically, it's available on GitHub and elsewhere on the internet. Um, and this goes to another thing. It's the usefulness of having code like, say, remote shell code that you can just uh, upload whenever you exploit the system and to get the remote shell up and running easily. And you can pipe this through Metasploit or whatever. Um, but having this type of code and this type of exploits is readily available on GitHub as something that you can just download and then drop into a system and use it. I don't know. Uh, there is value in having the code available. There is value in people looking at the way this is done and all of that. But it still lets lots of script cases that will just download this and throw it against the server, let them get access to stuff they shouldn't. And they don't even have to sweat it to get that. So it's just like freebies for, for everybody. If you know an Atlassian server that is up and running, uh, congratulations, you have root shell on that server. You just need to upload the code. And for one, it takes away some of the excitement of actually doing something like this, but it, it simplifies it too much, in my opinion. Um, yeah. We were joking. We were joking before we started, and you were saying something that was actually pretty interesting about somebody applying to a hacking group and saying that they had experience on hacking Atlassian. And yeah, congratulations, you and millions of other people. It's just drag and drop at this point. Right. It's like, like, yeah, you're not getting into our hacking group because uh, that's that that's too kindergarten. You're going to have to be on a different level. Atlassian is just low hanging fruit. So, not imp you're not impressing us at all. That's probably yeah. what they might say. Yeah. And yeah, at this point, this has been exploited in the wild. People are aware of it. Um, it's not as big as Log4j because the installed user base is not as large as Log4j, which was everywhere. Um, 
this has a small intel install base but still 75000 servers i believe you mentioned before 75000 a... yeah customers and, and one thing to keep in mind is that there's two kind of universes with atlassian software there's the version you can download and host yourself which is what we're talking about mm -hmm. then there's a cloud version so I, i'll make that distinction so um you know they're trying to push everybody in the cl in cloud. There's there was a cloud outage recently, so now I'm sure a lot of people aren't very uh, keen on that anymore. Um, if you're hosting it yourself, it it is a lot of work. Um, I, I'm going to be completely clear on that because I'm trying to really censor myself here to not give any information that that names anyone or anything. Um, but companies that I have been involved with that have been involved with supporting hosted Atlassian software customers have had to somewhere around four to five times a year, all hands on deck, let's patch um, every year. Okay. And when this happens, everyone loses obviously, but um, you know, if there's a vulnerability found, I'm sure all the really awesome people at Atlassian that are creating these patches have to give up and cancel plans, which is horrible. Um, so I feel bad for them. But then all the MSPs have to work with all of their um, people that they host to work with them to get updated. And it was so bad that we were writing instructions, very, very clear instructions with how to install a patch for a client, right down to all the commands that need to be run. And we were pulling people from other departments to contact customers and run the commands. People that don't normally do this kind of thing. We would spell it out to the point where, um, for the most part, it's just copy and paste. We just need some hands and you know someone in front of a computer to do this. Um, we were pulling people from other departments. People were canceling plans, and this would happen several times a year. And that's unfortunately what it was like to deal yeah, with that. With the current flow of vulnerabilities, it being in crisis mode is like the the standard now. It, it's weird right. when you're not when the week goes by and there's not an all hands on deck meeting, just to deal with the latest new CV that happens to affect something that you're running. Right. Um, but the, the, this one is a gift that keeps on giving because the reaction is like, oh, again, um, or the anxiety somebody would would feel when they see the uh, letters NDA and at last can show up in their inbox. <laughs> yeah, that was not fun. Um, so here's the thing. we I would like to talk about what's involved with um, actually, you know, the technology and how, how this is exploited. There's things on GitHub now. Okay. It, it's all right there. It, it's a, like you were saying, a remote URI. It's a remote code execution. Um, anytime we say remote code execution, that's the worst thing <laughs> right then and there. So if you're running the software right now, uh, on your end, then what I'm understanding here for Confluence specifically, because that's what this vulnerability is for, the fixed versions, and, and we'll have this in the show notes, but 7.4.17, and yes, people that work with Atlassian, they have the version numbers memorized. I'm not even kidding you. So this might seem like a lot of information if you don't work with it, but people that work with it, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I just did dot .16 yesterday, if that makes sense. So 7.4.17, these are the fixed ones, 7.13.7, .7. then we have 7.14.3, 7.15.2, 7.16.1, 7.17.1, 7.18.1, 7.19.1, 7.20.1, 7.21.1, 7.22.1, 7.23.1, 7.24.1, 7.25.1, 7.26.1, 7.27.1, 7.28.1, 7.29.1, 7.30.1, 7.31.1, 7.32.1, 7.33.1, 7.34.1, 7.35.1, 7.36.1, 7.37.1, 7.38.1, 7.39.1, 7.40.1, 7.41.1, 7.42.1, 7.43.1, 7.44.1, 7.45.1, 7.46.1, 7.47.1, 7.48.1, 7.49.1, 7.50.1, 7.51.1, 7.52.1, 7.53.1, 7.54.1, 7.55.1, 7.56.1, 7.57.1, 7.58.1, 7.59.1, 7.60.1, 7.61.1, 7.62.1, 7.63.1, 7.64.1, 7.65.1, 7.66.1, 7.67.1, 7.68.1, 7.69.1, 7.70.1, 7.71.1, 7.72.1, 7.73.1, 7.74.1, 7.75.1, 7.76.1, 7.77.1, 7.78.1, 7.79.1, 7.80.1, 7.81.1, 7.82.1, 7.83.1, 7.84.1, 7.85.1, 7.86.1, 7.87.1, 7.88.1, 7.89.1, 7.90.1, 7.91.1, 7.92.1, 7.93.1, 7.94.1, 7.95.1, 7.96.1, 7.97.1, 7.98.1, 7.99.1, 7.10.1, 7.11.1, 7.12.1, 7.13.1, 7.14.1, 7.15.1, 7.16.1, 7.17.1, 7.18.1, 7.19.1, 7.20.1, 7.21.1, 7.22.1, 7.23.1, 7.24.1, 7.25.1, 7.26.1, 7.27.1, 7.28.1, 7.29.1, 7.30.1, 7.31.1, 7.32.1, 7.33.1, 7.34.1, 7.35.1, 7.36.1, 7.37.1, 7.38.1, 7.39.1, 7.40.1, 7.41.1, 7.42.1, 7.43.1, 7.44.1, 7.45.1, 7.46.1, 7.47.1, 7.48.1, 7.49.1, 7.50.1, 7.51.1, 7.52.1, 7.53.1, 7.54.1, 7.55.1, 7.56.1, 7.57.1, 7.58.1, 7.59.1, 7.60.1, 7.61.1, 7.62.1, 7.63.1, 7.64.1, 7.65.1, 7.66.1, 7.67.1, 7.68.1, 7.69.1, 7.70.1, 7.71.1, 7.72.1, 7.73.1, 7.74.1, 7.75.1, 7.76.1, 7.77.1, 7.78.1, 7.79.1, 7.80.1, 7.81.1, 7.82.1, 7.83.1, 7.84.1, 7.85.1, 7.86.1, 7.87.1, 7.88.1, 7.89.1, 7.90.1, 7.91.1, 7.92.1, 7.93.1, 7.94.1, 7.95.1, 7.96.1, 7.97.1, 7.98.1, 7.99.1, 7.10.1, 7.11.1, 7.12.1, 7.13.1, 7.14.1, 7.15.1, 7.16.1, 7.17.1, 7.18.1, 7.19.1, 7.20.1, 7.21.1, 7.22.1, 7.23.1, 7.24.1, 7.25.1, 7.26.1, 7.27.1, 7.28.1, 7.29.1, 7.30.1, 7.31.1, 7.32.1, 7.33.1, 7.34.1, 7.35.1, 7.36.1, 7.37.1, 7.38.1, 7.39.1, 7.40.1, 7.41.1, 7.42.1, 7.43.1, 7.44.1, 7.45.1, 7.46.1, 7.47.1, 7.48.1, 7.49.1, 7.50.1, 7.51.1, 7.52.1, 7.53.1, 7.54.1, 7.55.1, 7.56.1, 7.57.1, 7.58.1, 7.59.1, 7.60.1, 7.61.1, 7.62.1, 7.63.1, 7.64.1, 7.65.1, 7.66.1, 7.67.1, 7.68.1, 7.69.1, 7.70.1, 7.71.1, 7.72.1, 7.73.1, 7.74.1, 7.75.1, 7.76.1, 7.77.1, 7.78.1, 7.79.1, 7.80.1, 7.81.1, 7.82.1, 7.83.1, 7.84.1, 7.85.1, 7.86.1, 7.87.1, 7.88.1, 7.89.1, 7.90.1, 7.91.1, 7.92.1, 7.93.1, 7.94.1, 7.95.1, 7.96.1, 7.97.1, 7.98.1, 7.99.1, 7.2.1, 7.3.1, 7.4.1, 7.5.1, 7.6.1, 7.7.1, 7.8.1, 7.9.1, 7.10.1, 7.11.1, 7.12.1, 7.13.1, 7.14.1, 7.15.1, 7.16.1, 7.17.1, 7.18.1, 7.19.1, 7.20.1, 7.21.1, 7.22.1, 7.23.1, 7.24.1, 7.25.1, 7.26.1, 7.27.1, 7.28.1, 7.29.1, 7.30.1, 7.31.1, 7.32.1, 7.33.1, 7.34.1, 7.35.1, 7.36.1, 7.37.1, 7.38.1, 7.39.1, 7.40.1, 7.41.1, 7.42.1, 7.43.1, 7.44.1, 7.45.1, 7.46.1, 7.47.1, 7.48.1, 7.49.1, 7.50.1, 7.51.1, 7.52.1, 7.53.1, 7.54.1, 7.55.1, 7.56.1, 7.57.1, 7.58.1, 7.59.1, 7.60.1, 7.61.1, 7.62.1, 7.63.1, 7.64.1, 7.65.1, 7.66.1, 7.67.1, 7.68.1, 7.69.1, 7.70.1, 7.71.1, 7.72.1, 7.73.1, 7.74.1, 7.75.1, 7.76.1, 7.77.1, 7.78.1, 7.79.1, 7.80.1, 7.81.1, 7.82.1, 7.83.1, 7.84.1, 7.85.1, 7.86.1, 7.87.1, 7.88.1, 7.89.1, 7.90.1, 7.91.1, 7.92.1, 7.93.1, 7.94.1, 7.95.1, 7.96.1, 7.97.1, 7.98.1, 7.99.1, 7.10.1, 7.11.1, 7.12.1, 7.13.1, 7.14.1, 7.15.1, 7.16.1, 7.17.1, 7.18.1, 7.19.1, 7.20.1, 7.21.1, 7.22.1, 7.23.1, 7.24.1, 7.25.1, 7.26.1, 7.27.1, 7.28.1, 7.29.1, 7.30.1, 7.31.1, 7.32.1, 7.33.1, 7.34.1, 7.35.1, 7.36.1, 7.
um, there's no repository for the for the software. You download a bin file, and what people have to do to patch this, I'm not even kidding you, they have to clone the server first, which technically you should be doing that anyway, right? Because you don't want to upgrade production without testing this. Mm -hmm. But when you do this, you're not just looking to see if the software comes up. Oh, of course you are. You, you try to update it. But if their license is expired, they can keep using it for pretty much forever unless they update. Then it triggers the, the license and won't let anyone log in. Um, so you have to check the license. Then the average person has like 30 plugins and at least five of them is going to be broken and they're going to expect you to tell them which ones in particular are going to break or they won't even talk to you about letting you update their server. Um, there's a lot that goes into this that I do feel is more than the average software when it comes to patching. Obviously, nothing I'm saying right now is unique only to this, but there is a there's like a several page long checklist we had to do. And there's also UI testing, user experience testing or whatever, um, UX testing, not UI testing, that we would have to do with the customer and spend time on this. And they would have to like do their workflows against different versions just to make sure every little thing works because we have overlapping versions, like I mentioned. Yeah. That's why it's such a big deal to update Atlassian software or and administrators get, you know, sad when they see a new vulnerability comes out. That's a very interesting point, and it's not just specific to Atlassian or just specific to this vulnerability. And it's a trick for your sysadmin book. Um, whenever you update a software that's mildly complicated or mildly complex, you should always try to get some stakeholder from your company that actually uses the software and knows how to do things in the software, not you as a sysadmin, mm -hmm. and have them try the new version first. Oh, in, yeah. Do a lab deployment with the new version and let that person that's the expert, the one that uses it daily, let him try it, not yourself. You won't find the problems. You don't know where to look for, to find the problems. Get the expert in the company to use this in the new version, even if it's just for a couple of days, and he'll report back if it's if everything is working or not. Keep that in your, yeah. your notebook. That is so true. Um, and, and me and that individual, we ended up becoming good friends. <laughs> we really did. We we you know started. We're working together. You know what? We're then we're always talking because we're going to talk eventually anyway. So may as well just keep chatting. Um, yeah, absolutely. You have that person for sure. Yeah. So here's the thing. I could go on for like five more hours ranting about this, and I won't. I'm going <laughs> to stop right here. Um, do you have any other thoughts about the Atlassian things? I think it pretty much boils down to patch. And I'm sorry you had to go through this. <laughs> Yeah, but we're the ones apologizing, not the blessing. Um, That's true. Well, somebody has to, right? I mean, people feel bad. Like, someone you guys should. are my heroes out there. You guys are yeah, awesome. Someone should. And sysadmin appreciation day, it's just a couple of months away. So somebody should thank you. Okay, so yeah, keep it up. Good work, guys. Um, yep. I know you're reaching to, to keep ranting about the blessing, but I think we should really move on to, to the That's next one. point too, right? I, I think yeah, we yeah. got the point across. It's hard to maintain, but it is a super yeah. important update. That's basically it. Yeah, it's a super important update. It's a really nasty exploit and a really nasty vulnerability. If you are running it in your company, tough luck. You have some patching to do and some configuration work ahead of you. Um, yep. But still, you need to do that and do it quickly. And the next one, uh, and this is a, a full going full circle because we've already talked about supply chain attacks and all that. And last week, uh, we there was this thread on Twitter, like millions of other threads. But this one was interesting because it showed a screenshot of somebody claiming to have one of Dell's certificate. And um, what that means was that somebody was claiming to have Dell's private key and could sign stuff as if they were from Dell. So, for example, signing a binary file for an update from code that that person controlled, and it could be sent to your computer if it's from Dell and looks for an update, and nothing would complain in the whole process. It would just take the code, it was properly signed, and yeah, it would happily run on your computer. Um, that turned out not to be true. Uh, the person was apparently just photoshopping the, the image, and that was disproved. But the, the real question here is, what if it was true? 
Right. And if it was true, it's a really nasty attack on the supply chain. And the thing here is that this is not even a hypothetical. This has already happened in the past. We've had CA authorities, uh, certification authorities, having their root certificates stolen or hacked or whatever, and somebody could get to the keys and could issue certificates that would be accepted as valid. And that was pretty nasty. That's one of the reasons why most vendors right now will not sell you three years certificates and you're stuck with one year certificate. So that if somebody somewhere is found to be using stolen certificates, at most they will be issuing just one year certificate. So there is a definite expiration date for this attack. Right. Um, it's also one of the reasons why SIM and Tech had to sell their CA division yeah. because the, the certificates that were stolen were from C, from SIM and Tech. But yeah, uh, that, was, that was horrendous. I'll never forget that. They they were the butt of all jokes at that time. Yeah. Online. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just just think about this. On its own, it's not a big deal. But if you have the resources to mount a a mildly complex attack against a company that you want to, to infect computers on. And this is a really good way to get your code on those machines. If you know they're running a fleet of Dell workstations and all of that, every now and then they'll check in with Dell to see if there are updates, say, to firmware or to drivers or whatever. Um, if you can forge that request in a way that doesn't trigger any alarms, like you could if you had that certificate, then all the machines would pick up the code, would run it happily, and now you were in those workstations. And that's a foothold inside the, the network perimeter that will probably let you reach other places. That's a really, really interesting attack vector. Yeah. Yeah. And and Dell, I'll say, at least when I used to work with, with their products a lot, at least back then, it might still be the case. They did a a good job keeping the BIOS up to date. I, I would sometimes have like a latitude, which is their enterprise slash business line of um, computers, get a firmware update like years after I would think it would be like done with that because the machine would be like five years old or, or something. And I even remember one, and this is why firmware updates are sometimes important with Dell. Like I remember the D630 and, and people know who what that is if, they, if they're into notebooks. Um, it maxed out at this time at four gigs of RAM, it's an older machine. And they literally released a BIOS update that would enable you to update it to eight gigs. Who does that, right? But if, if somebody, for like you're saying, if somebody's forging this, that's, um, I mean, enterprise people, they're looking for these updates because it's usually, there's a reason why these exist and it's not always security. Sometimes it increases the lifespan of the computer and uh, this would be very egregious. Yeah, yeah, and even for driver updates, something simple as that. Um, as long as you accept the the connection to the server and it can authenticate properly and make sure and impersonate Dell servers, you're halfway there. Oh, yeah. um, and this is just an example. There, the way that uh, updates and uh, code signing works today is that we implicitly trust the certificates as long as the chain is okay. We had this issue with Let's Encrypt certificates last year that expired. The the one one of the top mm -hmm. certificates that they had expired. And in some systems, that would break the actual update tool so that it couldn't update yourself and you had to manually go in and update it because it wouldn't trust the chain anymore. So it couldn't pull updates because it didn't trust its own updates. Um, and the reverse of that is if an attacker manages to compromise, say, Windows Update uh, certificates, and they manage to impersonate Windows Update, you can basically own any infrastructure because at any place, you'll have some Windows machines running. Even if it's just one or two running some edge case software that doesn't run on Linux or anything else, those machines will be there and they're configured to automatically look for updates without your intervention. Um, and you'll manage to find a way into those systems through a forged certificate like this. Um, this is the type of thing that can make the whole security castle crumble pretty quickly. Yep. If it's properly signed, if the certificate is valid, if there is no red flags there, it will be accepted everywhere, basically. And you won't even be aware of it until something nasty happens, basically until the attacker wants you to know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely the case. Uh, I mean, there's nothing, 
I shouldn't say nothing because I gotta be I gotta really watch my words with this podcast because if I say like this is a really big deal and there's always a bigger deal there's always and uh, there's no absolute because some once I say there's an absolute somebody will figure out something worse but um, driver and BIOS updates are so egregious especially considering BIOS updates can um, reinfect machines no matter how many times you wipe the machine I mean there's some pretty serious things and, and if you're dealing with servers that's even worse because they're much more expensive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this time, like you're saying, it was just somebody that might have photoshopped or whatever. It wasn't a real thing, but it is the real possibility. Yeah, it is a real possibility, and it has been seen in the past, and it will probably be seen in the future. And it's one of those types of things that it's really tricky to protect against because you're not going to be able to check all the certificates in the processes that you're running. That just happens internally. So until somebody raises the alarm and you see some warnings on security websites and security news feeds and all of that, you won't even know that you were a target of this. Right. Um, everything seems okay. Everything is legitimate to the systems that are pulling the updates. That's kind of where we've evolved to. When I the very first virus that I've ever seen was like the same as all the others at, the, at that time period. They destroyed data. They were annoying. They're tedious. It's like God darn it! I lost all my photos now. Um, Got to restore my backups because the virus came in and um, replaced all my files. And then so you knew that something wasn't right. You saw it. It was your machine isn't booting at all, or it is and it's sluggish, or your files are gone. There's something noticeable. And nowadays. It, the, the, whole, the goal is to stay hidden. That's the goal now. If, if you don't notice it, that's the goal. That's what they want. Yeah. Um, or it's something egregiously obvious like ransomware that will show yeah. you that splash screen, but those guys directly went your cash. They just went the monetary reward for that. Um, for something like spying, for information exfiltration, for classified information, for intellectual property, for all of that, the idea is to stay hidden as long as possible inside the target network. Right. And that's where the value is. That's the that's your end goal is to be able to look at the systems without anybody else noticing it. The longer you can stay there, the more information you can gather, the more value you extract from the attack. Yep. So there is there is an incentive for people to find ways to attack systems and to attack infrastructure like this. And this is just one of those. Like when we talked about the BVP47 tool, for example, mm -hmm. it used some pretty advanced stuff and it did some really nice tricks to stay hidden and to stay infecting a system. Um, and again, the goal there was to persist for as long as possible without raising any suspicion that it was there so that it could continue to exfiltrate data. And this is the same type of thing. You, If you're using a, an attack vector like this, like a forged certificate, first, it takes a lot of effort to prepare the infrastructure so that the traffic gets redirected to you rather than the official site. But if you're willing to go the, the length that it takes to, to do this, then this is a really, I was going to say profitable, but that might not always be the direct goal. But th this is a very interesting way to, to go about doing it. And it yep. will raise no alarms. You will be able to stay hidden while you are attacking an infrastructure for basically as long as you went or until you make a mistake. Or until the news, you know, just publicizes or, something to the point where people go looking yeah. for this on their own servers. That could be the very thing that trips them yeah. to the fact that, that there is something there. Yeah. And yeah. to to protect against something like this, the the obvious thing will be to blacklist the certificate or to blacklist the certificate chain if you just want to be more aggressive. But you have to know which one it is. So you will have to find the certificate at some point and then be able to blacklist it. And yeah. this is where something like uh, having your own um, authentication, your own certificate authority in housing your infrastructure can help because you can blacklist at that level. If all the machines trust the CA that you have in your infrastructure, then you have a central point where you can blacklist this type of certificates. Mm -hmm. um, that's something to consider if you're looking into securing your infrastructure is having your own CA. Yep. This is, you can set this up both in Linux and in Windows. It's doable in both. Um, and it's something that you should be looking into, at least to provide you a way to centrally disable certificates like this so that when you you catch wind that some, something like this has happened, you can just go ahead and block it immediately rather than waiting for it to be blocked upstream. And just make sure you're paying attention to the blogs and the news and the CVEs that are coming so that if um, 
you know, something relevant to anything you are using on your end is there that you read it, understand it, know what's going on and um, make some decisions and talk to your people about what you found. Yeah. And make, make a, yeah, do exactly that. You absolutely have to check those things. And keep listening to this podcast because we'll, we're tr still trying to raise awareness about different ways that you can be attacked and you can protect your systems. Yeah, I love that about this podcast. It's gonna, I, I think it's really going to teach people to think outside the box, and that's always the best thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. At least we try to. Yeah, If you're not thinking outside the box while the attackers are, right? <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. And they can be pretty inventive and they can be pretty creative. So if you want to be on top of things, you have to be as well. Yep. Totally agreed. All right. So any other thoughts we want to throw out there? <laughs> no, this was basically the, the two stories that caught my eye in this past few days. Um, and yeah, the, even if the second one turned out to be fake, it's still a good, a good thing to raise awareness to. Uh, certificates are the foundation of most of the communication that we do and the trust that we have implicitly to other systems. And it can also be forged and it can also be attacked. Yep. All right. Well, there you go. Well, we appreciate everybody watching and listening. We love doing this. So uh, definitely another fun episode. We have like um, an endless number of episodes coming after this. So <laughs> subscribe on whatever your chosen podcatcher is, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, until the next one. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye.